You have okay. to go ready, action. We're good. Uh, due to the governor's executive order 7B, this meeting will be recorded and uh, will be made available to the public. Um, hi, everyone. How you doing? Good, sir. Good, good. Um, uh, why don't we get right into it? I'm, I'm calling the meeting to order. Um, we do have something to vote on, Pete, right? With um, Joe Sulo. So yes. we need six members. Uh, we have one, two, three. I think we're right there um, as we speak. Uh, so I think we've got a quorum uh, for that, which is good. Um, so why don't we get right into the, and again, you can, as we've done in the past, if you could just give us the, the low hanging fruit on project updates, you don't have to go through every single one, anything that you think is worthy of note, uh, so we can get into the, the meat of what we really need to discuss today, Pete. Sure, I think uh, the uh, immediate thing is the uh, Charles restaurant, I believe is now, maybe as of yesterday, um, serving in their outside uh, dining area. Uh, they, uh, I don't think are planning on opening inside uh, tomorrow, but uh, shortly thereafter. Uh, so um, not sure if anyone's paid them a visit yet, but they are now uh, open. We've got, uh, I think, four other applications pending for outside dining. We're waiting for some information from those folks about their plans. Uh, so those are in, uh, in the process. Um, 1210, uh, the former Puritan, uh, we're waiting for the state to sign off on their traffic uh, certification. I think the building department is ready to go. Uh, once we receive that, they have, they have started doing some site work, which doesn't require a building permit, so they are uh, proceeding. Um, obviously, the Borden, uh, the new building is uh, open, and they uh, uh, did a little business after hours uh, last week, so uh, uh, that's uh, off to a, a good start. Um, we have, uh, and then the last thing is, we have a PNZ meeting tonight. We have a pre-application for a mixed use project up on the Berlin Turnpike. Uh, it's on a property that we call the Turgeon property. Uh, the angle on that is it has property in Newington as well as in Wethersfield. So we're gonna have to do some intermunicipal coordination on the permitting for that. Uh, it's a pre-application, so it's just very preliminary. Um, so those are the, the couple of highlights. They would have, where would they get access to that peak? Would it be off the street, the side street there, or off the turnpike? It would be off the turnpike. So this is, um, this is, I think, literally the last property in um, Weathersfield um, before you get to the, uh, the intersection farther down there. So um, there's a little white house there. It's sort of falling apart. It's been vacant for a long, long time. So. Right. Um, it, if you're familiar with that, it, it, it's behind the um, Salvation Army and those little strip centers in Newington. Right. So it's kind of an L-shaped property. Yeah. Um, so quite frankly, you might not see much of the development that it's going to be lower down and yeah. behind. So um, it's been proposed previously. No developer has ever taken the project on. So we'll see what happens um, with this one. Just a heads up on that. Hey, uh, Peter, quick, quick question back to the uh, earlier comment about the permits or the requests that folks have for outside dining. How easy is it for the restaurants to get that? Is it a long process? Have they been able to comply with the, the rules pretty quickly? Is it difficult? Uh, it's not difficult, but we find that um, they, they don't have the uh, skill sets to put together the plan in an accurate way so that it gives us something to you know, approve. So we've had to go back and forth. We did put a little template uh, on the website along with the application form to try and help with that, to give them an idea, but it still seems to um, slow them down a little bit. Uh, we, we really only have 10 days by, by the governor's order to process these. However, if we ask for information, it starts that 10 day over again. So, um, so we've, we've had to do uh, a bit of uh, handholding uh, to help people put those plans together. Okay, well, that's, I mean, that's, that's what I was going to ask, is coaching. Yes. That's, oh, yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Schematic-wise, Pete, that's what they're being hung up on, laying out the tables and stuff outside. It's the scheme. Yeah, and uh, we've had a couple of um, uh, conflicts, let's just say, with a couple of restaurants um, about that distancing. You know, there, some, some were trying to interpret it as six feet between the tables. 
it's six feet between people. So we've had a, I guess a, a difference of opinion with some okay. um, unnamed restaurants. So. Um, but the statute is very clear or is it unclear? Well, I, it, it's just common sense. You know, you want six foot separation distance. So if somebody's, you know, sitting in their chair, which is two feet back from the table and the right. same situation happens behind you, you know, they end up being two feet apart, head to head. So uh, it's, it's that kind of thing. So, um, you know, things are tough and people are trying to maximize how many tables they can put out there. So you can kind of understand it. So we have to unfortunately be the, uh, the arbiter on those things. So that kind of wrote, thank you for that. That kind of rolls into reopening Weathersfield. Um, for those of you that uh, may have not been on the call, we did do a uh, reopen Weathersfield, uh, like a webinar, if you will. Uh, we had a number of businesses online. I think it was very, uh, it was well received and the people that were on the call, I think got a benefit from it. Peter, do you think we need to schedule another one of those, maybe more restaurant oriented, or do you guys think you have that under control or? I think we have it under control. Um, the, the information on the website has been getting um, uh, a bunch of hits. I think the, uh, the webinar, uh, after we ran it and then posted it, uh, last time I checked, which was, I think, last week, it had nearly 100 views. So uh, we've been promoting it, letting people know if they have questions, go to that, and also go to the links that we've provided. So um, things have seemed to kind of calm down a little bit. I think, uh, um, obviously, tomorrow uh, is the next phase. And... Um, you know, the restaurants are just, I mean, the bottom line is people have to, you know, make sure that the social distancing and the hygiene and all of those things are being uh, followed to the extent uh, they can. We have received some complaints, which we have followed up on, um, but they have not been overwhelming. So it's been manageable. Pete, Pete what, what would be our responsibility of following up? I mean, we're not calling the police, I guess. I don't, I think we're going to get a ton of calls like that. If somebody didn't have their mask on or something like that. What, what do we do as a town? Uh, we will go out and it depends on the nature of the, you know, the complaint. We did get complaints, as I said before, initially about the seating and the distancing. So we actually had to go out and uh, have that particular location move. I think they ended up losing maybe four tables. So it depends on the degree. If it's an individual, you know, someone's not wearing a mask, we'll just, you know, politely remind them if the onus is on them to make sure their customers and their employees are following the guidelines established by the state. Um, and then, um, as I say, in other cases, we will go out there and actually measure things to make sure they're complying. That's why it's important. We're requiring a detailed plan to make sure those things are being, we don't want to approve something and it's um, you know, going to have to be chased down for a while. Peter, on the phase two, because they're going to be in uh, restaurant dining uh, starting tomorrow, right? Yes. Um, do they have to provide a schematic inside for that as well, or just tape off, if, from what I understand, they just tape things off? They have to self-certify themselves. So the onus is basically on the, uh, on the businesses themselves. They have to um, stick to 50% occupancy, the distance requirements, a lot of hygiene, uh, employee, you know, uh, face masks, all of those kinds of things. So, um, um, and it's not just restaurants, it's also tomorrow um, nail salons, uh, indoor um, entertainment, so um, bowling alleys, uh, gyms, gymnasium, you know, health clubs, uh, hotels, um, yoga studios, Movie theaters doesn't apply to us, but those are the those are the big ones uh, effective tomorrow. Okay. Um, let me know. Um, and Deb, um, I see that you're muted there. If you can unmute, I want to get your perspective, Deb, if you're there um, on the business side and what you're hearing from the chamber. Hi. <clears throat> um, I was going to suggest when, when I had a minute, maybe I could send something out again, seeing if the businesses do need another webinar. Do you think that would be helpful after tomorrow's reopening or let it be? Um, I'm, I mean, it's, um, 
the short answer is we want to serve the community. So if you talk to them and there's confusion and, and, yeah. and you get an overwhelming, you know, if you get one person that says yes, but if you get kind of a, a vibe that they need some counsel or whatnot, we could, we could put that together. It does require some planning on our side because we have to get all the department heads together um, and whatnot. So if you get a vibe on that, because um, in a way we could save, potentially save Pete, a lot of these department heads having to go out to areas and look at things that maybe um, they could have done correctly before they went out. So it could actually save time. Um, so, so what I've been, I, I have had a few calls and a few emails and what I've been referring them to is the uh, Weathersfield, you know, site with all the um, regulations on there. And I, I have followed up with them and I, I have nothing at this point. They seem to be okay. Okay. Well, just keep us abreast. You're kind of the, you got your fingers on the pulse there. So if you sense something, you know, send up a smoke signal and let us know. Will do. Okay. Thanks, Deb. Anything else you want to add, Deb, on the reopen aspect? Um, no, I think, no, I, th I think actually it's running pretty smoothly. So I, I've gotten some positive responses from, you know, owners in town. I haven't had any complaints at all. Okay, send them all to Peter. Um, any of the complaints? If I've got his cell phone number, let me write it down and put it up here. Um, <laughs> Thank you for okay. having my. I get, let's give him his home address too. You can stop over there. It'd be easier. <laughs> <laughs> well, I told him that he was going to have a webinar during dinner time, so we're, we should be all set. Perfect. Hey, this, uh, I just have a question back to Deb and to Peter. We do have, like I said, we do have that electronic sign. And I know Deb and I talked about it, and uh, I think Gary and I talked about it. If we want to put something about second phase coming up today, whatever, we want two or three placards to I, – I don't want anything to do with my business. I'm just talking straight from the chamber or for um, the town because we have a ton of cars go by there. You know, we are now open, um, bowling alleys, whatever, whatever we want to put, you know. Um, you guys tell yeah. me, and I'll get it up there right away, all right? Well – um, yeah, we can talk offline. I have a good idea on that. Or, you know, I mean, you can direct any questions to the chamber to sit, to help Peter out. And, you know, if there's something I can't handle, I certainly can, you know, refer, refer it back, but just give the chamber, uh, email, I think would be, um, would be good. We can talk offline as far as, far as the wording. Okay. Thank you. No, for no problem that. at all. Anytime. Great. Um, Pete, anything else to add on reopening? The only uh, last thing is uh, just a, a heads up. We have been working with um, Hartford Publications, which puts out Hart the Hartford News. Uh, they uh, approached us, I don't know, three or four weeks ago uh, and are out soliciting businesses to put together a, a little piece uh, regarding the reopening of businesses and inventory of who's open, uh, what their information is so that people know which businesses are open in order to, um, you know, further support the shop's local idea. So I think they're planning on trying to get that printed and published by the end of the week. Um, they were doing a couple of uh, uh, op-ed editorials. They were gonna promote what's going on down at the River Restaurant and all of his improvements. I think they were going to write something about the Webb Dean Stevens uh, Museum expansion and a couple of other little pieces to uh, incorporate that into the, uh, into the ad piece. So just a heads up, you may see that uh, circulating throughout town in the next uh, few days. Yeah, Peter, one last question. Um, a lot of focus and discussion around the restaurants. Um, are we getting any feedback or information about businesses? I'll, I'll, I'll just have to saw an article lately about how does this hit like dry cleaners pretty badly, right? I mean, I just did my first drop off of dry cleaning today. <laughs> I haven't done, done one in months. Um, do we, do we get Intel feedback or offer help for those businesses that sort of don't pop straight to mind, that, but have probably been facing revenue reductions? Or they, I have, or I have, I have not, yeah, I haven't been that dialed in. We're hearing rumors about a couple of businesses that may not, you know, make it through, but those have not been, um, confirmed yet. Um, some people have decided not to you know, obviously pursue the outside dining because of the costs and the limitations and the lack of room. It's just not worth it. Um, so we're hearing different things, but um, um, 
you know, we're just trying to spread the word to the residents to, you know, if, if, if someone is open, please, you know, give them your, your, your support to the extent that you can. So, um, but we don't have, um, you know, programs, so to speak, to offer them to help offset okay. than just providing the general information. If you're trying to get the paycheck protection and some of the other resources that are out there, here they are. And here's uh, how you can best pursue them. Got it. Thanks. Great. Um, let's get to the self storage moratorium. Um, before we start on that, I want to thank Gillespie Photography um, for their uh, wonderful work. You guys probably saw the um, the packet that went out. Um, if you guys want to take an opportunity, unless you've already taken an opportunity to take a look at it, um, it was pretty insightful. Um, the stuff that Pete found. I mean, we had heard that they were doing interesting things design-wise, but there were some really thoughtful designs on the facilities that we saw, um, anywhere from mixed-use residential to retail um, to uh, large structures, four or five stories high, which is what we've been proposing. Um, it was pretty telling. Um, Pete, we didn't get a chance to obviously be there with you. And again, I apologize, I couldn't make it. I got called out, but um, what were your overall thoughts um, on what you saw? Well, I can um, share my screen and we can just quickly crank through them and I'll just throw in my two cents and then we'll get to the end. Right. And does that sound like a perfect like, plan? Let's just see if I can make this work here. Can you see, is, are, you, are you seeing that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well done. Here's the agenda. So this, um, get my notes here so I get the right town and the right. This was in Milford. This is a facility called the Lockup. Interesting uh, name. Um, like a fake brick. It's sort of a combination of interior and exterior. It has the doors on the outside, but it also, if you see the larger uh, garage doors there, you can go inside and a lot of the units are accessible uh, interior. So that's, this is standing in a McDonald's parking lot. McDonald's is right next to it. So it's right on a, a strip similar to the Silas Dean Highway. Uh, this is just a, as I was driving by, it was a busy street, so I couldn't really park out front, but it, you know, glass brick, um, three stories, you know, awnings and canopies just gives you a sense. Um, just another similar view. Uh, this is another facility just down the street. Uh, it's called America's Finest uh, Self Storage. Um, more of a warehouse looking structure, but you could imagine if it had more windows, it literally would look like, um, you know, an office building. This is a, a, a really a more significantly sized. Unfortunately, it's just uh, under construction, just steel framed, but what is that, five stories? This is standing in a stop and shop parking lot. So it just gives you the context. These are no longer found in industrial parks. Um, just another similar shot. Uh, this little frame building right here in the front is a Starbucks that they're building as part of this development. And I'm standing in a um, Popeye's chicken parking lot. I guess they have pretty good chicken sandwiches. Um, and it just shows you it's in a shopping center, just to give you some context. This is, I believe in Norwalk. This was interesting in that it's a mixed use development. Um, once again, I'm standing in a, a shopping center parking lot looking at the property next door. This is to the left of what I was looking at. I just turned a little bit to the left. So that's an apartment building that's just built as well as part of this development. So it is a mixed use project. They share the same driveway to the back there. Another shot from the parking lot behind uh, the building. This is the um, backside of the self storage. It's a sloping property. So you can see they've got a lower level entrance. They also have the garage door entrance as well for drop off and delivery. This is the last one. This is in Ridgefield. Um, so this is, the ent this is the entrance to the apartment. So this floor, the second and third floors uh, are all apartment buildings. 
if you go down this driveway here, that's a, just a, a second shot. It's also a mixed use development. This is a, um, an assisted living building next door to it by the same developer. Uh, this is standing in the assisted living parking lot. Gives you a flavor of the, uh, the architecture of the building. And somewhere is a shot of the lower level. There we go. So this is coming down the driveway below the apartments. And here are the self storage. Uh, there's interior door here where there's an office building and then these garage doors um, for the self storage. So it just gives you a kind of an overall. So that's four or five projects on that trip that I took. So uh, you can see it's not your traditional self storage that um, one level kind of um, mini warehouse style. So I, it was quite an, it was quite revealing anyway. And all of these are relatively recent in the last two, three, four years at the most. Uh, some even more recent than that, obviously. So, um, so there, there we have it. Peter, um, do, are any of those uh, projects by the same development company? Do you know? No, I, as my understanding, they're all separate uh, development firms, separate storage uh, brand names as well. Would it be possible to just um, reach out to those towns to get the name of those developers? I, I, I have them somewhere in my notes. Um, Good. So I, as part of figuring out where these were and who, did, who I've got a bunch of background information in terms of square footage, who the developers were, that, that kind of thing. So I can, um, I can get some of that information for us. It, it looks like there's, as you'd expect, right, a zillion different styles. Um, I don't think there would be a lot of opposition in the community if it's a, a decent style from the street and it doesn't have, you know, too much gating or industrial looking stuff right on the Silestine itself. It seems almost like an aesthetics and a landscaping play more than anything else. Yeah, I agree with you, Paul. Um, the, and I think the moratorium has given us time to kind of like fine, fine tune that and, um, you know, at one point we'll make a motion regarding um, the moratorium because we do need to get um, our hands dirty and, and wrapped up on what we want to provide as, a, as P and Z requested from us wrapped up, you know, something to present them that makes sense. Um, and, but I, it, it was impressive. You know, uh, we have had some um, casual um, and semi sort of in-depth conversations with the owner of Weight Watchers. Um, and there are some things that are coming about. He's been pretty proactive on getting back uh, to us. Um, we've been um, quietly um, trying to put together a, a, a structure from the RDA um, that would allow us to have a little bit of financial teeth, if you will, on assisting in these projects. And um, the, you know, the, the idea of self-storage, based on what I was exposed to at one point, what we're seeing here are light and are night and day. Um, but I think the idea is to get a, um, a motion that we want to present, um, um, that we have control over the design, just as you said, Paul, where it, it looks like a friendly environment and uh, a friendly uh, to, the, to the aesthetics, as you say. The, um, the concept of having the development towards the back of the property has been kind of amenable to um, uh, the owner of the property and to potential um, developers. We're, we're, we're at step one of step 10, uh, but there's been some movement and some good conversation and uh, but nothing significant yet uh, to report but um, they are aware that we are looking for um, 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 uh, further motion from him and from other developments including uh, metaplex um, um, and others that we're very focused on these and we want to assist in any way we can um, so i think Pete, what i'd like to do is in, in, in talking to you today I know that you've been kind enough to help me put my words together here for a motion. And I'd like to make a motion um, to recommend that the staff prepare 
an application to revise section 5.2 H.3 of the zoning regulations, um, RC zone uh, storage facilities to incorporate additional requirements to include definitions of mixed use uh, design standards um, and multiple story uh, requirement. Um, and that EDIC and RDA will work with the town staff to prepare this amendment by July 3rd um, in order to have a public meeting on September 1st. Um, and that is my motion. I will second that for Who is that? Second, second that? I, I second it. Down, down, down. Tony, did you have a question? No, I was going to, I was seconding at the same time as Tom, so it doesn't matter which one. All right, so put down Tony as uh, second B. Um, <laughs> and Tom as, as, as A. Um, any discussion on this? I have a comment. Um, I would be in favor of carving out the silo steam and saying that we don't want any storage facility on the Silestine Highway. Um, I'm less concerned about other parts in town like the Metaplex or on the Berlin Turnpike, but I just don't think it's the right kind of development for the Silestine Highway because of how, of, of what it says about the town when you have then two storage facilities right on your main thoroughfare. And so I, I, any sort of, you know, any kind of input from, from um, EDIC or RDA, I'd like to carve out the Silestine Highway because I just don't think that it's, that, that storage is where we want to go regardless of what it looks like. Any other comments, uh, Judy? You have to unmute yourself, Miss Judy. You have to unmute yourself. Let me try, let's see if I can do it. There we go. Try it now, okay. Judy. Um, <clears throat> I, I kind of agree with Tom in a way that uh, the South Dean is really not, that's not the best use for our, our major thoroughfare. Um, I do not think that the Mediplex building should be storage. That's a, a, a neighborhood and I, I can't see a storage facility there. But uh, on the South Dean, if the facade area of the building was the mixed use and in the rear was the storage facility and if it looked as nice as some of those that we saw maybe it would work um, I think any other comments yeah I, I was originally I think folks probably remember I was probably in Tom's camp um, early on because I, I had a lot of uh, preconceptions and whatnot um, from from an I get it. I think the challenge is, is, is we've got a property that's been just sitting there unused that could definitely have a better use. I think given the economy and where things are, I don't, I don't see another Borden going in there and I don't see it big enough to be another Borden uh, or opportunity of that nature. One question I would have as they think about the design, is it, is it repurposable over time that when they build one of these things, if either storage isn't needed anymore, that you know, the demand falls off that you know, we don't end up with another vacant property or semi-vacant property. Can it be repurposed to something else? Um, and the only other uh, area I'd think about is, we think about the Silas Dean side, um, what's behind it, I forget, is that still a neighborhood back there? Yeah, it's separated by the tr uh, railroad tracks and there is a neighborhood, yeah. Yeah, I think we should just be cognizant of the backside of it and, and what that means to, to folks that live back there aesthetically. I've always been concerned that if something really high got built, you'd, you'd throw a neighborhood into a shadow for, you know, a huge chunk of the day. Yeah, I think that's a, I think everybody, what they're sharing are important considerations. To go to what Tom was saying, um, uh, I think the concept, Tom, is that the storage facility would be designed in the back and there would be retail in the front um, and that the, the storage facility in the back would have a um, architectural and design tie-in to the building in the front, which would be lower. So what, and again, this is just one person's opinion and one person's idea, but that was kind of what the thought was. So from the street view, you would have either mixed use or retail or in the front there. And in the way back, you would have an area that would go up maybe three or four. I think the, the permitted use uh, is 40 feet, would be maybe four stories up behind that top. 
and it would sit back. As you know, it's a very deep lot. So the idea is to, um, and um, one of the things that was a strong consideration is if you guys recall, I was pretty blown away by the amount of uh, revenue um, storage facilities uh, threw off from a tax perspective. It was, it was, and frankly, it was impressive and it kind of educated me to a degree. But the whole idea behind here is that whatever would go in there, the motion that I made is that we would have creative authority over that from a design perspective, that if it doesn't meet our criteria, then we would not approve um, what they're looking for. That's the, that's the, that's the whole concept. So the, the concept mm -hmm. that we're currently working with, and again, everything is subject to change, is that the facility, the storage facility would be towards the back. It would not be road facing. Um, and that whatever structure would be in the front would either be tied in, maybe into the storage facility as one building, or it would be as a separate slab um, in the front. So a separate use in the front, followed by the storage facility deeper uh, in the back. Um, just so I wanted to make sure that we had clarity on that. Oh, I understand. I, I do get a sense, though, that we're moving a little bit from the moratorium into a discussion that sounds a little bit more to me that we'd be working with a developer to get a storage facility in there, you know? And I just wanna be clear that, that I'm, I'm firmly opposed to any storage facility in any form, any fashion, whatever the facade looks like, anything else uh, on the Silasteen Highway. I wanna interject here, a couple things. First of all, uh, that property uh, has not been developed. And the, type of best use probably, if it's not some type of storage facility, would be retail. Let me indicate to everybody that when the Planning and Zoning Commission approved of the Puritan property, we approved 462 parking spaces. I repeat that, 462 parking spaces. As it is, once the Borden is in, uh, is in business and once the Puritan Medical Building is in existence, the Silasteen Highway is going to be a traffic nightmare. And if we can get- I don't agree. I don't agree. I don't agree well, at all. Finish. I don't think you should say that without any sort of a traffic study at all. I, don't, do. I just do not we agree have with one. that. I'll give you the traffic study. You do not have a traffic study for the Silasteen Highway. Yes, I have you a do traffic not. study. Have you, have, a traffic you have a traffic study, study for, the, for the properties. Uh, you have the tra a traffic study for the properties around the Borden and the medical complex and Milltown Avenue and Mill Street. You do not have a traffic study for the Silasteen Highway. But it's a traffic study that shows the number of extra cars that, uh, let's not hear about, that, okay. that appear on the Silasteen Highway. I, I really believe that it's going to become a traffic nightmare, that the lesser uh, use uh, that would allow development of that property and, and the only use that people have come forward with was some kind of a self-storage. The owner of the property has some people interested. I'm sure there are other people interested. And of course, we would have to be sure that the, that the development comes in the way that, that we want it. But I think it's a mistake to keep it open and think that we're gonna get some magic uh, uh, the retail facility is gonna to come to Wethersfield. Retail is gone. The retail business is gone. Everything is online. I think we have to understand where we're going as a business climate going forward in the future. And I think this is the best use for it. I, I respectfully disagree, Tom, that's all. Any other comments? Just, just one for Dan or, or for the group, Dan's, uh, Dan's comments and Tom's comments about the parking study um, or the traffic study is interesting. Um, over time, like, do we ever evaluate the either unintended consequences or uh, outlying consequences of traffic, meaning we study the individual properties, we study the Silasteen, but in the days of now with Waze and um, uh, Google Maps and all the traffic things, if, that if, if it becomes a super congested area, apps like Waze are going to start redirecting traffic into the rest of town or into other parts of town. Um, is that something that we should just think about in the future as we, we consider traffic patterns? I, yes. I, I, you're, I, I, you're correct in that um, when we do a traffic study, it's, um, you know, it only assesses uh, those intersections in relatively close 
proximity to the development site. Uh, Dan was mentioning, uh, there were, uh, Dan was commenting on the traffic study for the Puritan, there were a few driveways that had a level of service uh, F, um, which is the lowest category in a traffic study that you can classify, but it was specific to certain turning movements coming out of those driveways at certain peak times. Um, um, so that, I, I think just to clarify with Dan's, Dan's concerns about the future of the Silestine Highway, but um, yeah, it, it is something obviously that um, we need to be mindful of, but we're not at that point, it, uh, except for a few, a few spot locations. Do you think it's wise for this commission to authorize a traffic study of, of that area so that we're all comfortable? You can authorize all you want. There's no money for it, so. <laughs> Tom and I are going to go and we're going to count cars. Dan, yeah, you can come with us. I was going to say we could authorize Dan and a clipboard and, and <laughs> bonus coffee out there. <laughs> any I other, any other Peter, comments? I think, we, I, I think we should give Peter another job. There you go. I think this discussion is healthy, Tom. Well, I do too, but I also think you're too car focused, you know, and, and I think we need to do other things in terms of traffic calming on the Silestine Highway and with, with bicycle and pedestrian improvements and, and do things like that, it, you know, that, that we shouldn't just talk about number of cars, number of cars, number of cars. I mean, you, you have a, a certain perception of the Silestine Highway. I don't. I mean, I, I, you know, the only time the Silestine Highway to me gets congested is when there's a problem on 91. You know, and my other, and, and, and I'll go back to something Mark, I heard Mark say a couple of years ago, he said, you, you got to remember too that a, a, all those cars on the Silestine Highway are also eyeballs looking at businesses on the Silestine Highway. So I don't, there aren't traffic jams on the Silestine Highway. You know, every once in a while there's some congestion on Route 3. But, but in terms of, you know, any traffic expert will come in there and they'll say there's nowhere, I bet you they'll say it's not over capacity, it's not at capacity, and I bet you they're saying it's not even near capacity. I, I beg your differ. We have a different opinion with the opening of these new businesses. I think it's going to be a traffic nightmare. And the other thing is just to remember that if we leave it, we're looking for some kind of a uh, commercial retail developer to come in. And I do not see that happening. It's been sitting there for a number of years. There's been no bites. Uh, and I don't see that happening uh, in the near future. Right now, we are holding $200,000 from the state to the help a developer in the demolition. If we continue to wait, there's always the possibility because the state's financial condition that they will take that money back. That's, that's a, we're in a perilous position with that $200,000. Is that correct, Peter? Yeah. But I just, yeah, I, I'd just like to it. say something. I, I definitely like to say something. On, on Tom's point, uh, being a police officer in town for over 20 years, I, I don't see an issue with traffic at all. I, I don't even, even if we fill these businesses up, which is a good thing for us, I don't see it ever being a problem for police or anybody else. Uh, the other thing is to point out that property has never been, never been properly advertised to sell because it's a bank account for the owner. I know we're on, uh, but that, that has to be said. If somebody really focused on getting rid of that business, that business will be gone. And we should, as a, as a board, we should be looking at making more money for our town, making the town better. And we have to do what we have to do. So I said it. I'm good. I concur. Well, I think, you know, the, the uh, one man's traffic jam is another man's marketing uh, blitz. So uh, I think the, the concept is trying to find the answer. You typically is somewhere in the middle. Um, I, at this point, with the motion that I've made, we're trying to be thoughtful that, because if you guys recall, it was my initial concept was to put a moratorium for parking, uh, I mean, for self-storage in all of Weathersfield. And, and that, that I, we were looking for the best use. And the idea of seeing a jail cell looking place, block windows directly on the Southstein Highway um, in my mind, and I think all of us at the time uh, was not a starter. That, that was, it's a beautiful piece of property and with the right design and whatnot, it could be a gem. So with the idea that we control, and again, it's just, just because we're giving the potential option to storage with a lot of restrictions, doesn't necessarily mean storage is gonna end up in there. 
I just don't want to rule it out at this point. I think Dan's point, and I think uh, Dan Silver's point, and I think all of us would agree, um, you know, especially with the pandemic, we've done a lot of shopping online and retail has suffered dr tremendously. So, you know, unless it's medical, um, you know, medical that could go in there or um, service or fast food or, um, uh, you know, there's, it would have to be a service driven um, business to go in there. Um, you know, we're, from a retail perspective, we're certainly going to be limited. I don't think that's going to be an option on, on somebody building retail there. Um, any other comments? Uh, Mark, I have no problem with uh, <clears throat> putting the storage in the back as long as it's designed in such a way for the neighbors behind it. It looks something like maybe an apartment building, so it's, you know, eye-pleasing to them. And on the front, if you want to make it a different look, you know, that's another thing. But uh, you know, it could be a gen, you know, great tax revenue, like you said. Plus, you know, you might get a couple of small things. I mean, we had talked before about a couple of potentials from we had before that couldn't get in there because they needed a third. This would give them the third, and maybe those other two businesses would want to come back in, and we could fill that whole parcel. Yeah, I agree, and I think that goes to part of the design that you know, towards the neighborhood back there, there needs to be some thoughtfulness on you know, what that looks like, because it certainly will be changed the view. Now, granted, they've been looking at a, you know, a waste zone for 25 years. So maybe anything back there would be an improvement. But I think you're right, Tony. And again, that's what this motion does is it gives us the teeth to be able to dictate um, what we want to see back there. And if it doesn't meet a criteria, then they don't, it doesn't go forward. Um, any other discussion? Leslie? Yes, I would, I would like to definitely see the pad sites in the front with the self storage in the back. I think that would, would satisfy a lot of the requirements and wouldn't overburden the town with too many cars. That would be my best use. Peter, do we want to tighten up the motion? Um, you may, it does say, it doesn't really state in the motion um, that the facility be, would be towards the back. And we'd have to be very centric and talk about this motion is not about in general, but it would be specific about that lot. And I don't know if that presents a danger or not. Um, My, um, I, I've obviously, I've been taking the fastidious notes. My uh, idea here would be that over the next three weeks or so, I will draft something up and we can schedule a special meeting. We have one more meeting before the date I ac actually have to file the application. Uh, so we could either wait to that regular meeting, I think, um, or uh, we have a special meeting in the meantime to take a look at the, the language and try and get everybody's uh, you know, final thoughts into that. Um, and I'm, I'm listening to what you're saying. I got to figure out creatively how we would restrict, you know, the retail to the front and, you know, the, the self storage in the back. It's, um, we're getting into minutia that you typically might not see in a zoning regulation, but let me, let me um, give some thought to that. But I would, uh, I would uh, like to have additional input from you guys before we finalize this thing, rather than just sending me off to submit something to P and Z. So. Uh, yeah, I, can I ask something? Is it possible that if we adopt some type of a zone change <clears throat> that we can have perhaps the council adopt some kind of, of a rule that if a developer comes through, it has to be uh, given to a, a committee. In other words, rather than just going through planning and zoning uh, like we ordinarily do, it would have to be uh, first go to uh, a committee for study as far as the aesthetics and what we want as we're talking today. Well, we, we have that with the design review advisory committee already. So they would be, uh, they would play a, a, an important role in, in reviewing the aesthetics and the design uh, of the building. So I don't think we have to reinvent the wheel by um, creating okay. another, another entity. So we just maybe have to have a conversation uh, or grab some of the design review members at, at, at this point, make sure they're aware of what we're thinking and uh, what our preferences are. So I think that's manageable without doing anything above okay, and beyond. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Any other comment? Mark, this is Joya. 
Hi, Joy. I just want to make sure any changes we make, though, apply to any self-storage going forward and whether it's feel correct. It's not specific just for this one site. We are talking about anywhere else, even if it's on the Berlin Turnpike or any other area of town. This is just overall, we don't want something coming in that is not aesthetic or doesn't fit the neighborhood it's going to be in. Uh, I 100% agree with you, and I think that's the intent of what we're working on. And uh, to, to your point, Judy, just for the record, there's been no interest on self-storage at Metaplex at all. I don't think anybody's looking at that for that. I just want you to, to be aware of that. Nowhere on the radar. And that and property is uh, residentially zoned, actually. Right. So it's not a possibility. Any other comment? Okay, we have a second on, on the motion. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. aye. Any opposed? Okay, great. Thank you for that. Tom, uh, Carson, you or you did you are opposed, right? No. No, I mean I'm I'm in favor of the motion. I'd like to okay. see what the language is going to be, though. You know, yep. at some yeah. point and. And if I don't like the language, I may be speaking, you know, you know, yeah. <laughs> the next time. But that's fine. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of it. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. Yeah. I want to go on record and say, Tom, you really should tell us how you feel because if you keep it inside, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna be hurtful. But it's yeah. important that we get commentary on everything. Yeah. This Zoom is very liberating. <laughs> 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 okay. Great. Um, let's move on. Um, we have two, um, I think one we can act on, the other one I think we're still um, uh, in limbo. So Pete, new business, the uh, Vincenzo La Noche uh, project. Pete? Peter's frozen. It yeah, looks like he's frozen. <laughs> he's frozen. Oh yeah, he is. <laughs> You know, actually, usually when you get frozen like that, it's never complimentary to how you look. That's not bad. <laughs> Somebody's got a goofy face on. That's pretty good for a freeze. Um, we'll wait for him. Um, I, I do know um, a bit so I can continue on until Pete dials back in. Um, the Lenoche, as you guys know, we talked about that in the last meeting. Um, uh, th they have requested additional funding, as you know, uh, but we do not have enough data um, from them at this point to uh, support uh, one way or the other, any additional funding um, for that uh, particular project. Um, we do have, as you know, more information, uh, which was in the packet that you got on the project on uh, 1773 Berlin Turnpike, uh, the former Pet Supplies Plus uh, facility. Um, I'll wait for Pete to give us the, uh, I've got all the gory details here, but wait for Pete to maybe join back in. Um, you guys get a copy of the facade improvement application in front of you in the package? Great. Yeah. Mark, um, I had a good question. Is there, is there enough information though now to really separate the dollars? It wasn't 100% clear to me when I was looking through it. Um, that, that's a question that I had as well. That he did okay. go through and answer the questions that we did have in red um, specifically. Um, some of them do have to do um, with uh, with money, but there was a I think on um, the exterior work schedule, um, which was dated 52120. Did you see that um, particular piece? I think that's the same piece that we may have looked at at our last meeting. Right. Um, so uh, the short answer is Peter has also had conversations with him, so maybe he can add a little bit more detail uh, to that, which is basically why we sent them back because we just needed a little bit more detail and some specifics. Um, let me shoot a me message to Pete. I think him, him and Tom went to the bar. Uh, oh, Tom's back. Okay, Google. Call Pete Gillespie Mobile. We can just call Pete and see if he's okay.
Oh, no problem. We're talking about you. Um, you blipped off. Uh, the, the Keen Foundation, they don't buy the actual Zoom, so we get kicked off at, at 50 minutes. Um, you guys have the corporate account. We can talk forever, I'm sure. Yeah. I think you're back. We're looking at your keyboard. And there you are. All right, let me hang up. Pete, um, I did inform that um, uh, the uh, La Cava La Noche project, we still don't have enough data on that, I think, to move forward. Um, but uh, Joe Sulo did answer some of the questions that we had. Um, one of the things that Joya brought up, which is a question I think the group is going to have, is do we have any more finite detail on where the spending was based on the questions that we had at the last meeting from Joe Sulo? You're muted. You're muted. You're muted. <laughs> you have to unmute yourself. Thank you so much. Um, in answer to your question, I did not get a revised cost estimate. He's stayed with the um, the additional, uh, the original estimate that he gave us. So it's the same. Uh, it's dated uh, 5-21-2020. Uh, he did add elements to the plans and the information. So I, the costs must have definitely gone up, but nevertheless, he did not provide us with any further clarification of the cost estimates. He provided some narr additional narrative about what he was going to do. He provided some revised plans uh, about the questions we had. Um, he provided some revised drawings, but um, did not change the uh, the estimate of the costs. Uh, Pete, re or a group, if someone could refresh my memory, what were the specifics that we had on the cost? Was it the uh, windows and the demolition, I thought? I think um, Tom had mentioned that the, um, the windows and whatnot seemed to be within reason, if I recall properly, Tom. Um, That's where, do we, where do we need more detail? <laughs> I, you know, I don't have it in front of me because I'm driving. I apologize. Oh, so I don't okay. want to just go off the cuff. But I know we talked about it was just a general, um, I thought it was just a general build out that we were concerned with. Uh, some, of the, some of the prices seemed a little outrageous and, and they were redundant, if I remember. So just to ref uh, to looking at the cost of some of the aluminum storefront and glass was 26,000. Yep. The stucco was 12,000. That was another big ticket item. Um, exterior sidewalk was 10,000. Uh, the masonry on the exterior of the building was 8,000. Demolition was only 4,000. Structural steel was another 4,000. <clears> Electrical. Pete, lighting. I think that's what it was. It was the mason and stucco and um, and sidewalk, we felt like that was all just that masonry just got stuck in there. If I if I remember, I, again, I don't have it in front of you, so I apologize. Yep, yep. So um, the aluminum storefront glass was twenty six thousand. The stucco was twelve thousand. So that's thirty eight thousand. Uh, the structural steel is forty two thousand, um, which is just shy eight thousand of what. Um, he requested signage, obviously, I think he included that as well. Is that correct, Pete? Yes. Okay. Actually, I'm looking at the, if, if you look at the photo of the existing building and then you look at what he's proposing, he's actually closing off uh, a bunch of windows with masonry. So I, I don't think the masonry number is, um, is that out of whack with what he's actually proposing to do to close off the facade. So, um, and Pete, the structural steel, was that to support the window structure where they were? Okay. 
And with the structural steel, I mean, would that be considered facade improvement or part of, in order yeah, to get the facade improvement, you would need it? Yeah, the windows and the masonry all, you know, hang on the, hang on the steel. So it's all part of that. Um, Yeah, you're right on the masonry because there's a lot of stuff being filled up there. Yeah, yeah. Can I ask a question? Please. The, um, on the town website under the facade improvement program, it says that we require at least three written estimates. Is that something that's just gone out the window? We have been, we've been having lots of difficulty with people getting the three estimates um, in in the early days wasn't such a problem but it's become an incredible problem even now with um, you know what's going on in the in the construction world I mean the construction guys have been working throughout this whole thing so uh, it's still uh, a problem um, so no we have not been pushing that part of it um, I suppose we could as a condition you know, I mean, I, I'd be comfortable with at least in, at least two estimates, you know, so so we're just not going by what what, what they provide us. But I know that. Well, I'm not hey. really exactly sure how it happens, but I'm just concerned right. that, oh, these this is what it costs us and we have to just go by it. Yeah, I agree with you. But the thing, Tom, is when it's all said and done, I mean, he's got here what looks like enough to give him the 50,000. But when everything is said and done, when he comes in with his final for reimbursement, if the reimbursable expenses are under 50, he doesn't get the 50. He gets what he actually gets and the rest of the money goes back in the pot for reuse. So it's not like he's guaranteed the full amount, even if we authorize it. Yeah, the, that was discussed at the last meeting because I had the same concerns that I think the group has is when they come in, they go through receipts and look, they're looking for what you actually spent on that stuff. So a lot of this stuff, you know, obviously nothing costs exactly 12,000 or 26,000, et cetera. But I think they're um, probably in the ballpark, but there is an audit uh, when they come in um, where they go through with a fine tooth comb, uh, the expenditures on the property that need to come directly from whoever the contractors are that he's working with. Um, so it's, a, I agree. I think it's always good to try to get to uh, estimates, try to get somebody to come out to my house to do something. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm basically paying people to do work now um, above and beyond my house just to get people out. It is, it is an issue. Um, I think it is a little loosey goosey up front, I would admit, but it gets very tight when they have to go in and actually get the money. And that's where the audit comes in. Um, but I mean, I as a group, if you feel as though we should get, I'm, my guess is, he may have gotten, knowing Joe Sulo, my guess is he got 10 estimates, um, and this might be the best of what he got, would be my guess. Um, he doesn't want to overpay just like anybody else. But again, what, there will be a significant audit when they actually go for the money. But I thought we were talking about Lenoche. Nope, this is, um, this is Tough Shed on Berlin Turnpike. Um, oh yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No worries, no. Uh, Mark, Lenoche. can I can I just ask a question? Please. Um, I, I, I understood that the facade improvement program was more to enhance the building and make it more palatable to the people driving by. This sounds as though with he's putting in walls with all the masonry and the steel and everything. That, that almost sounds like a rebuild rather than an enhancement of the exterior. That's just my opinion, but... I don't know. What's the intent of the uh, of the program? Well, it's both. it I is mean, exactly. The, yeah, it's ahead. exactly what we want. I mean, if you look at the existing photographs of the building, it's uh, yeah. Oh, dramatic, they're terrible. It, yeah, it's a dramatic yeah. improvement. So it's a this is a significant enhancement, which um, maybe uh, he's doing more work than we would typically uh, see in a, just a general. And he, and even if you look at the Lenoches, what the building was before and the work that they basically almost tore the whole building down. These are the kind of things that I think um, we definitely want to support. Okay, all right. Just um, on the cost estimate, um, we have not been paying for paving and, I mean, he threw in site work. I don't know what that means as it relates to the paving. It might be the preparation for the paving. So um, we have steered clear of, that's a significant 
number, that's almost $50,000. If you subtract that from the 135, um, he doesn't, he doesn't hit the 50 uh, yet. So um, if there's a, a, a motion to provide him money, I think it, I think that those numbers, maybe someone wants to check my math here, come out to like 87,000 total, um, which would be what, 40, 43, five, something like that. If you were to go the full, full amount for what qualifies. Um, you're right. The only thing, without not, with us not knowing what site work and paving, we don't know whether or not that would be a credit towards the improvement or not, but I right. think your guess is probably a pretty good one, Pete. And do we usually include demolition? Is demolition usually? It's included? sometimes it's written into other line items. He's obviously got to do the demolition of the windows and all of that in order to do the actual work. So uh, it does, it is part of the facade improvement, so. Peter, can you tell me again, the 80,000 that we have, that's, that money came from where? Is that taxpayer money or is that, I mean, is it Weathersfield taxpayer money or is it a grant that we got it's from a combination the of both over the time. The, the, the funds have become, uh, we, we were, uh, for a couple of years there, we got 50 and 100 from the capital improvement program, the town funds, and then uh, we got some of the steep grants. So the funding has become commingled over time. So it's a, comes from a couple of different sources. We also got some money back from a couple of people and that got put into the pot. So it's a mixture, but uh, primarily state. I would say the majority is state funds uh, with the town in sort of second place. Now we've been issuing these on a regular basis up until about a year and a half ago. And other than there was a complete lull, we would have two, three applications at a time uh, that the committee would be reviewing. Um, and for whatever reason, um, we had no ap new applications coming in. Uh, so this is the first one you know, to come in in a while. But um, it's some of the programs that we've approved uh, are just marvelous. I mean, you go by the old Wethersfield and in other places, and they've really uh, made the, the facades um, really, do it, really good just improves the quality of life in town. I think the good news, Dan, is that we're, we're running out of projects to, to improve on the facade, which is a good thing. I think that's why we're getting lowered. Um, so Pete, you're taking the, which I agree with, you're taking the site work and paving the 48,000 away from the 135, is that correct? Yes. yes. And what is that math, what is that? 87,000. 87,000? Yep, I think that's what my math said. So half so of it's that 43.5. 43.5, right. I make a motion that we approve of the, uh, the grant for that amount, 43.5. I'll second it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I'm going to vote no. I just think, and I know that, that, that the, 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 the history of the program kind of predates my time, and I'm just not just trying to be an agitator again, but I just think for the limited amount of money that we have left, um, as much as it's a real improvement on the property, I just don't think that stretch of the Berlin Turnpike is where we should give that much money for a distressed property. Um, I always see the Silestine Highway being one. I see Main Street, Weathersfield two. I look at everywhere else in Weathersfield three. And then I look at that stretch of the Berlin Turnpike because there's, there's really nothing when you're on that road that says you're in Weathersfield, even though you are in Weathersfield. And so I think it's a lot of money for, for a smaller building that I love the fact that it's a business that's coming into town, but I just don't, um, I just think it's just, uh, it's, just uh, it's just a lot of money to give one property owner. Tom, this, this committee, I don't know, it's probably before your time, um, adopted a motion that uh, when it comes to money left, we could put, say to uh, a developer, we're only going to give you $10,000 at a time because we only have $80,000 left. Or do we look uh, at a project that, that you know, comes in, and if the project is worthwhile, uh, we're going to go for the project rather than say, 
no, I'm only going to give you $10,000, which will probably mean the project would not go forward. So that was uh, this, you know, this commission adopted uh, that kind of guidance oh, a couple of years ago. Yeah, I just look, I mean, I look at the Charles restaurant and, and I'm shocked that they didn't come to us looking for money based on how that, that turned out. You know, I'm by that building almost every day, every day on my bike and I'm blown away by what that looks like. And I'm saying that's the type of project that you'd want to give money to because it enhances the character of the town. So I just think that this is something that's a done deal between the developer and, the, and his, his tenant. And he's just looking for some help from us now. It's not like he needs our help to make it happen. So, I mean, I, you know, again, I don't know if, 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 if it's okay that I'm voting no. I just think it's a lot of money to give when especially I'd like to see, and I don't see a lot of money coming into this program in the future, but I look at the Masonic Hall and I'd like love to have money available when and if something comes in there that we want or some other building like the Rite Aid or something on the Berlin Turnpike, on the uh, Silasine Highway. The Berlin Turnpike, I always look at for redevelopment purposes, not facade improvement. Um, and that's why I just think it's, um, it's just a lot of money, but you don't need my vote to make it pass though, do you? Okay, thank you for that time. Good. Any other uh, comments? Uh, yeah, I wanted to make a comment. Um, what Tom just said made me think on that section of the Berlin Turnpike as you're entering from Hartford, is it true that we really don't have a sign like welcome to Weathersfield in that area? Peter, I maybe think it's on Jordan Lane. Yeah, I think the back. welcome sign is up closer to Cedar Hill Cemetery. Yeah, it's up by the Hartford uh, okay. City of the So we Line. do have. Okay, so we do have. Okay. But not on the Berlin Turnpike. Uh, well, okay. this this divided part of it, anyway. Yeah. Do you think we need another sign like that in that area just to remind people they're in Weathersfield? I mean, it's just making me think now. Maybe it's something to think about. You know, because I think every part of Weathersfield is important. Agreed. Um, please, did we vote on that? Uh, on that? On, on yes. that? We did. We're, we're good, yeah. right? So All right. Eight, uh, eight to eight to one. Okay. You know, a good a good point though, just for future to think about is uh, Tom pointed out Masonic Home. Um, the diff clear delineation between what's a facade improvement and what's like a major overhaul. Yeah, you know, I was passing a Masonic thing this morning when I was down in the Roma Bistro, and I mean that that needs like major overhaul. That's that's an example of something that I think goes way beyond facade. So, is there like a cut point between what's facade improvement and what is significant? structural change in a, in a major overhaul? Um, I think the way it's written is that regardless if it's a structural change, as long as it improves the exterior of the facility, it qualifies. And we don't have the, um, the opportunity, the way it's written, to be able to pick on one market over another market and where we can spend the funds. Anywhere in Weathersfield qualifies uh, for the funding. Uh, okay. But I, you know, I don't. I think we haven't been put up. I, I think you pose a good question. I don't think we've been put in a position yet where we'd have to go. Are we? Is this an overhaul or is this a facade improvement? I think there's been some cases where we voted on stuff over the last five or six years uh, where we could tell what they were doing seemed more structural than facade improvement. That's why I questioned the structural steel um, on the estimate um, for this. But it's one of those chicken of the eggs. Without the structural steel there. You can't hang the windows in that area because they're they're redoing that's that whole corner of the building which does look aesthetically much better so it's a little bit chicken or the egg uh, to a degree but i think in this case it would certainly in my opinion would qualify um, i'm just thinking of the flip side mark like if you spend money on a facade but then the structural improvements don't get done so you have a nice looking structurally questionable building hmm. if you, you know so i don't know, just um kind of Kind of a weird thing, just sort of something we could probably mark down and think about for the future. Mark, I, I think that I have heard in the past in these meetings that that $200,000 that uh, is assigned to the um, thousand, uh, thousand uh, Sostein Highway, that could be redirected to the facade improvement program, correct? Um, uh, it's a good question. I'm not sure on that. 
What's there that? was some discussion about it at one time, whether or not it could, and Peter is gone now, but he could be the one to maybe to answer that question. Peter? No, it, it is true. It could be redirected to facade approval. We'd already got okay. that clarified once before. Okay, I thought so. It. So we, uh, Paul, we do still have some money left um, if it, in the case of a real emergency. Yeah. Yeah. Or worse, worse, if worse came to worse, if a project came up, Okay. And we didn't have that much money and we needed yeah. a few thousand. We could always go to the council to see if they can you know, move some money from contingency or unfunded balance to take care of you know, a facade loan too. We could do that request too. Yep. Hey guys, hold on a second. I've got Pete on the phone here because he got flipped off again um, and you can't get back in. Okay, so um, we'll approve uh, minutes. Um, do you have anything to add from uh, town, Ma uh, town manager's report? I, just, I know Gary's not here. Um, we have the council liaison is not here. PNZ is, uh, is here. Judy's here. Yeah. Okay. I have no report from tourism. Okay, thank you. Sounds like a sounds like a plan. Okay. Yep. So, guys, Pete, for some reason, uh, their system at the town hall uh, is not allowing them back in, um, but we can carry on without him. Um, Judy, was your question answered from Tony? Okay. Great. Um, so um, uh, we're good with Joe Sulo's application. Um, Thank you for the input from everybody. Um, um, I love hearing both sides of the story. It's important. Um, Gary is not here for the town manager's report. Um, town council liaison is not here, I don't believe. Um, P and Z, Mr. Silver, are you still with us? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Anything to report from P and Z? Uh, well, we have a, uh, a meeting tonight and as Peter said, there's a uh, developer coming in for not an application but for discussion uh, they're talking about uh, about a hundred units um, so I'm not going to say any more than that because we'll be uh, discussing that in uh, detail tonight uh, but that's along the Berlin Turnpike so it looks like the Berlin Turnpike is going and uh, I, I, I think that's good and, and I think that's one of the reasons I'm in favor it's in favor of uh, the Sulo that we Keep going. Let's get the turnpike going. Bravo. Anything else to add, Dan? No, there's nothing of uh, major. Um, Judy, you mentioned that you are you're good. Yeah. yeah. Nothing to report. I have not attended any of the tourism meetings uh, right now, so Peter would be the only one that would be able to give us any updated yeah. information. Got I it. hope to be able to go soon. Very good. Um, Chamber, Deb, are you still with us? I don't think I see Deb here either. Okay. Um, what we want to do, guys, is schedule. If you guys can get out your calendars, um, I think we should have, we don't want to wait until our next EDIC meeting, I think, to discuss um, the moratorium language and tightening up uh, the potential PNZ um, regulations. I think we cer certainly should meet at least once um, and this will give time for Peter to, to map out and put out the language and then we can get together and discuss. And what I'm hoping is we can maybe do something um, the last week of June um, of this month. Um, let me just take a look at, I know I've got to travel a little bit. Um, let's see. Um, how was uh, Monday the 29th for the group? Looks good for me. Yes. More, more, yeah, uh, afternoon is better than morning for me. Fine. Um, Tom, I want to get your voice there. Um, can you, you sure? Make, can you make? <laughs> do you uh? Do you can you make lunchtime work? Yeah, that's fine. Can the rest of the group make uh, say um, 
the, the lunch will not be provided, but um, can we meet, um, um, say, at uh, 1 o'clock on the 29th? Does that work? Yep. That's fine. 1 o'clock works. Good. 1 p.m.? Good. All right. So 1 p.m. on the 29th, there will be a meeting specifically to talk about the moratorium language, uh, and the, or I should say the PNZ language as it pertains to the moratorium. Um, Mark, and I hope that... I hope the town is adding up all the money we're saving on lunches. So maybe that can go towards the facade improvement. There you go. <laughs> okay, guys. Um, I have nothing to report above and beyond what I've been blabbing about. Um, subcommittee reports, uh, marketing communications and financial strategies. Um, uh, obviously, we're, this is basically part of marketing and financial strategies, actually. So our meeting on the 29th will handle that. Our next meeting is scheduled for Thursday, July 9th. You guys have a, were able to print out a copy of the minutes? Yes. Do you guys have a moment, take, want to take a moment to review and let me know if you um, have any changes or questions? Can I get a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dan. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Beautiful. All right, guys, I don't think we have any correspondence, so I'm going to go to item 11 and say uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you guys for the communication. It's important that uh, everybody speak up, critically important, and I, I truly appreciate it. Um, enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye, everybody.